I was, I was, do you know, when like, you're doing something, you're doing something, you're doing something, you're doing something over and over again, and you think something's really good, and then you have to take a step back and actually have a look at it, and that's exactly what happened. Now, Rafi's just come up with a point, and I'm sure those of you who are keen on following trends in digital media will already be aware of something called open AI. Can I show a show of hands for anyone who's here with this? There's a few people. Okay, now, OpenAI is just one of a series of software applications that you can access online that use artificial intelligence to construct particular documents and other applications that you can use. But the primary mode at the moment seems to be that people are using OpenAI and other software to do writing for them. Okay, so, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing for anyone to have a mess around with this stuff, but basically you go into the platform, you can put in a few terms of reference that you want the AI to create something for you, you can specify the length and so on, and then it will produce an essay. I did a, I did a demo of, it was an open AI that I used with it, it was a, uh, application called Moonbeam. I did a demo for the department about six weeks ago about this. And in five minutes, I picked one of the essay titles from MS100, put it in, and produced an unreferenced essay, but after referencing Pi21 first, took me, I got somebody to put the stop clock on me to see how long that took, and it was about 48 seconds. Now, the reason why I tell you this is not so that you go and do it. OpenAI is not untraceable. There's a reason why. If one person uses it, I can guarantee someone else will use it. This is inevitable. There is never just one. The fact is that somebody, some people in media degrees have been using this for some time because if I'm finding about about it now it means that some people were ahead of the curve of me and have already been using it in the past. It's not all I can do about that. But as soon as something becomes mainstream, you know more than one person's gonna do it. Now what is going to happen when that happens, when more than one person spits out an essay from the same artificial intelligence? Can anyone tell me? Similar work. Identical, usually. Semantically, and in terms of construction, it will show up as being of a very high amount of plagiarism. When there's two assignments or more submitted in the same module that are very similar to one another, this is actually a worse case of plagiarism than if you've just picked up something that you've seen online and dropped it in without the correct attribution because it means that people have collaborated to cheat. Now, very often in the case of this, there's usually quite an innocent party. You know, there's somebody who's, somebody's gone to somebody and said, can I have a look at your work because I'm really struggling? They do, and basically they try and pass it off as their own. That can be a really hard thing to unpick. It's a nightmare for the uh, academic integrity team when that happens, because you basically who's telling the truth and who isn't. It's really, really difficult. If I was doing that and I was the cheat, I would feel no obligation. I've already crossed the line, right? I feel no obligation in not backing down afterwards. But if it's produced by an AI, then you both think the shit, basically, or however many people it is. Now, what I would suggest is that we all get used to using these tools because they're not going anywhere. And if you want to produce ideas for how you should structure something, well, I don't see much wrong with that. But you've got to use things sensibly. You've got to assume that if you spit it out like that, you're going to get caught. Because you probably are, at the end of the day. Um, the way that these things are written isn't how you write. 
Does that make sense? I've already got examples of you guys writing. You know, I, I, I will know when something is AI because you can tell the style of it. And then you can just go back and look at what the other person has written in other things and then it becomes kind of abundantly clear that you didn't write this. That is not a difficult thing to swap. Now, I'm not trying to scare anyone here, okay? And I, I will reiterate this. It is useful, I think, to get to understand these tools, unquestionably. It's a really handy thing for people to know and understand. And if you can use them in a way that's helpful, then I don't see it as being a problem. It's just another thing that you can use to help you get good grades, which is what you want, and it's what we want. Yeah? But don't take the nuclear option here, just get it to do it for you. The penalty for using an essay mill, do you, do you know what I mean by an essay mill? Does it, is there anyone here who doesn't understand what I mean by that term? Okay, thank you. An essay mill is basically a paid-for service. There are, there are lots of them online. You can pay a certain amount per word for somebody to produce an essay for you. Not a great idea. Okay. <laughs> and actually quite expensive, really expensive. I, I, like a, a 2,000 word undergraduate essay is probably going to cost you about 500 quid. It, it doesn't seem very sensible to me. Give me the, I'll fucking write defeat for 500 quid, right? Uh, give me a ring. I'm available. But, the penalties for using an essay mill of court, and therefore the penalties for using an AI of court, which is a, if you get a free option of doing this, although they do have word count and a certain amount of, you can only do a certain amount of them without paying. That's not an academic misconduct. That's very often an instant you are asked to leave university. That is beyond plagiarism. That is deliberate deception which is contrary to the legal document that you sign when you submit. Well, you put your student number, you don't sign your name. But it's quite clearly in that document. And it is contrary to the student charter that you signed when you enrolled at the university. It is an attempt to defraud the institution, essentially. And you, people who get caught for doing that are asked to leave the university. So the penalties are very, very severe. So don't use it for that purpose. Have a mess around if you're interested. There are other purposes that you can use this for. Does anyone have any questions? What is going to happen in light of the emergence of these, of these services is that this list of essay questions that you've got for MS100, that's probably the last time you're ever going to get that. Uh, your university education now will not have this kind of assessment ever again. You will be instead given far more reflective and far more open pieces of work to do. So there will be a shift in how work is assessed in light of these developments with AI. That doesn't disadvantage you in any way, by the way. Okay? In fact, I think it's better. It's, it's more student-focused and it's more student-centred to actually assess it that way. So I'm just hanging on to remnants of the lost past year with this module, basically. You know, and I prefer to do, if you do, if you took modules with me in years two and two three, I don't give you essay questions. You do essays, but you don't get a question. That makes sense. Don't worry. It's not, it's not like mysterious or anything. Are you sure there's no questions before we go on? No. Everyone happy? It's warm in here. Damn sound warmer than his own. Right, it isn't week eight, sorry for the typo, but it is semiotic analysis. So it's, I'm kind of half right and I'm wrong. Introduction to medium of communication, we have looked at, well, what have we looked at? We did a whole bunch of boring shit about study skills, which nobody liked doing, and I'm, I'm with you. Fuck me, stop. Can you all do me a favor? Can you do the uh, module review, please? before we go any further. I'm going to give you three minutes. Myself, I know some people have done it already, but don't say what I said. Even though it's been recorded and it's going up on you. Done it already, Amy? I'm writing my...
was like, you, and just as I was walking out to go out of the building again, it stopped and then it went off again. Like, Never mind that shit. <laughs> Don't put that in the model. Yeah, it's like one. Yeah, Yeah, I can't get it. There's no survey. Yeah, no survey is on uh, my survey. Oh, right, of course. You should have had an email about it. Yeah. I think I deleted the email. Oh, nice one. That was clever, wasn't it? Hang on. Give me two seconds, I'll push the email to everyone. Sorry. Charming that is. Oh, wait. Sorry, if the my service thing isn't working, I'm just going to go into the system. I'm going to push an email out to everyone with the link. When did it? You should have had an email about this, but you know, it's yeah. I know how many emails you guys get from the university. It's hardly a surprise that the ones get deleted. Sorry. Because it is an absurd. No, it's an absurd amount of emails that they send out. Okay. Well, is it the? They are. I've sent a notification to everyone. Should come through shortly. Just to let you know, this uh, the, the end of module review is kind of more important than the mid one that you did like five, six weeks ago, right? I don't know if this has ever been adequately explained to you, but I'll explain it now what happens. All of the responses that I get, I get a report that averages out all the scores and collects together all the comments made. If there's no comment made, it just obviously doesn't appear, right? So, sometime in February, once this module is concluded, once all your final marks are done, you've had your final results, I'm asked to produce what's called a module report. So in that module report, there's some statistics I could put in, like achievement across the module, your achievement, and all the feedback that was got. But it's actually the focus is on the, this second piece of feedback rather than the first one. Then I have to write a narrative account of the module. So I, I actually have to reflect on what you guys have said, what scores you've given, and so on. I have to do that in a fairly sensible way, not in my usual way that you all are familiar with now of like, fuck this, I don't care. I actually have to engage with it in a proper manner. <laughs> that doesn't end there. That personally goes into what's called my PDR, my professional development review. So the feedback you give here gets reflected at a higher level than me. About, you know, basically my line manager comes in and says, You're fucking rubbish label, and this is why, this is why students think you're a piece of shit. And I'm like, yeah, tell me something I don't know. Secondly, this goes then to the program directors of your undergraduate degree. Now I used to do this job until this year, so I'm only too familiar with it. All the module reviews are collated by the program director. It used to be me. My job in the summer is to produce a report of every module. It's a big job, actually. That document comes to usually about 15, 16,000 words. It's not a great deal of fun to write, I won't lie. But it's a really important thing because that document forms the basis for what is called the Teaching Excellence Framework Grading for this department. Every department in the UK has what's called a TEF score. <clears throat> it's not, it is a score, it is a numeric thing, but they give you, because we're like infants, right, they give you a star rating, gold, silver, or bronze star, and I think there's some people who don't get a star rating, it's like the really bad ones don't actually get a star. Um, now, no word of a lie, this department is ranked gold, however, it's mostly ranked gold because one of my great skills as a writer is that I can take nonsense and make it look good. I'm a, I should be in PR basically, or I really should be in PR. So, I'm not frequently surprised when we get the gold because writing that document is a lot of the time me smoothing over things which have been raised in module reviews. But it has to be accurate. The university has a paper trail going back to the individual student that completes a module evaluation. 
I can't lie, I, I'm not able to lie about it or leave things out. I have to put everything in. But I do have to, I, I can make justifications when I'm writing that document about why things have been said and why things, and what we're doing to address those things. The reason why I tell you all this is because for a lot of students, and I, and I understand why, completing things like this sounds like a waste of time. It genuinely is not a waste of time. Everything that you put in gets acted on. Even if you don't make comments, those scores, and you know, not everyone does make comments, and that's okay, but everything that you do in these documents is acted upon, even the smallest little thing. I don't think there's enough ways that students can comment on their degree education. I genuinely don't, I, I don't think you have enough of a say, which is really bad considering we're charging you money for that. But this is one of the mechanisms for which you can do that. So I, I do encourage, just like I would encourage everyone to vote in an election because you've been given a vote, even if you went in and drew a picture of a penis on the paper, that's still a vote, by the way. It's just a spoiled paper, okay? But then people didn't know that, right? And saying, yeah, shit, that's what I'm doing in the next general election. That's what I've done in several. But you have been given the opportunity to have a voice. Please use it. Because if you don't use it, nobody knows how you feel. And that's really, really important. There's nothing worse than feeling like you're ignored or you don't have a, don't have a presence. You know, like me in a team meeting. Basically, you know, nobody listens to me. Nobody's going to listen to the psycho sitting over there with a you know, ring in his nose. Do you know? It just doesn't happen. So, please, when you're given the opportunity, use it. Are you all done? Superb. On we go then. So, semiotics, very, very important. Just as last week, um, looking at discourse as a way of understanding meaning, this is a different method of understanding meaning. Can I just have a show of hands? Has anyone ever done semiotics before? Only a few people. What context? Um, like, what do you mean by that? What subject were you doing like it in? Media or? A level. Media A level. I did it at Media A level. Brilliant. Media A level. Fantastic. You guys have done Media A level, that's wonderful. What did you use it for? Um, it was like the semi, it was like the theory, like the semiotics theory. And so, so like Roland Barthes, etc. Yeah. yeah. And we just used it to analyse like advertising and stuff and all that. Yeah. Wonderful. Perfect. You kind of pre you, you, you can go to sleep now because you've done this. <laughs> um, the use of semiotics here uh, in Media A level and other courses that use it is directly seen as a textual analysis technique to understand how meaning is constructed in media text. So advertising has classically been a really good vehicle to understand what semiotics is. An advertiser, or a, a, the creative individual who's responsible for the advert being created, will use a series of visual techniques to create a persuasive argument about the product. You know, this is the kind of the fundamental basis of what an advert is, right? You're going to show someone an advert, and you want them to buy that product. That, that's basically it, right? Now, semiotic analysis is a tool that we can use to deconstruct that advert, to understand the techniques that have been used to persuade somebody about a particular product, and you know, it's, great. It's, not, it's not just selling things as well, it's about trying to change people's behaviour in particular ways. For example, you may see anti-smoking adverts, they have a semiotic construction which is used to you know, persuade the person to not smoke. They're not even very subtle. Here you go. My cigarette packet has a couple of people crying over a coffin. That is not a subtle message, is it? <laughs> but it's kind of weird. I'm looking at them and thinking, yeah, sad times. Then we've got a light. Um, so, semiotics would allow me to deconstruct the message of that visual representation that's been given to me. And importantly, this is the bit I think, having been involved in sort of redesigning A levels over the last couple of years. This is the bit that I want us to appreciate is going forward from that level. 
Semiotics and the semiotic construction of texts are always linked to particular ideologies that are being expressed. This, I think, is the actual skill of deconstructing a text. It's actually not that difficult to learn. You know, it's, it's a fairly straightforward thing. But what people must do with semiotics is then understand how the construction and the intention of making a text links to a particular ideology. So, that's where we're going to end up today. We're going to begin by looking at this image. What is going on? Sexist. So, okay, why? Why is it sexist? Because it's assuming that the woman's going to be doing the dishes, and it's just so enjoyable. Well, let's start from there. Who do we have as the figure of attention in this image? A woman <coughs> plunging her hands into a sink, which we assume you know, there are bubbles in the sink. Let's not make any assumptions at this point. The start of semiotic analysis is always identify the elements of an image without preconception or presupposition. We have a lump. We have a sink or basin, whatever you want to call it. That's an interesting semiotic thing I'll get to in a minute. We have glasses looking very shiny. You know, that's some serious good crystal shit going on there. My glasses in my house do not look like this. They look stained and got watermarks on them because I refuse to dry afterwards. Drip dry, that's my boy, and it doesn't help. What else do we have going on here? Well, we have a tap or faucet, whatever your preference is. And we have some parts about the woman, the, woman, the main feature of this image, which need to be answered as well. We have a towel up here, we have a towel here. Both white towels. Important. Always note the colour of things in images. Colour is a great transmitter of meaning. And she's got some stuff on her face. What does she have on her face? I'm not a woman. Well, shouldn't really prejudice me against understanding this. We go on playing devil's advocate. What is on her face? Face mask. Okay. So, let's concentrate on the construction of this figure, first of all. Face mask, towels, naked shoulders. What are we to understand about this woman? Relaxed. Relaxed. Why? What could she have been doing? Maybe taking a bath. She's just come out of a luxurious sort of kind of bubbly bath because they're trying to link these signs together, right? So the whole thing going on here, this is somebody who's in a you know fairly good state of mind. You know, is quite happy with the world, just taking a bath. Oh, yeah. Has she just taken a bath? Hmm. The plot thickens. Has she just taken a bath? Or thanks to the foam and suds here, are we to believe that this is her bath? That fairy liquid is so luxurious that plunging your hands into it and washing up is much the same as taking a candlelit bath. Well, that is what we're supposed to believe. That's <laughs> an image. Um, see what I say about like, you know, lies? That's bollocks, by the way. But this is what we are meant to understand by this image. We are given visual representations the fairy liquid is very efficient for the actual job it does, what it's supposed to do. Look at them. These are some clean bitch ass glasses right here, right? This ain't my house. I do use fairy liquid. That don't happen. I need to improve my technique. I need to do my washing up in a freaking towel and mouth and, you know, face mask. That's what this is telling me. How do you do a face mask? Does anyone kind of. Just shove it on. I think I could achieve that. Um, and I know I would look younger than my, you know, I'm only 43, but at the end of this term, I feel like I've got a million and three, and I'm looking so bad. Um, does everyone get what's going on here? This, my friends, is a semiotic analysis. 
we are looking at what signs have been used, I will define sign in a short while, and combined in particular ways to create a meaning that we read. As a, a member of an audience, a media user, we read this image and then it gives us, but, haha! <laughs> When we go to ideology, we've already had the answer. Why is there not a man in this image? Well, there's that. Yeah, women are more attractive than men, although not to all people. Um, come on, okay, this is a theme of this module. You know, you know how anti-patriarchy I am. Let's have it. We see that she's the Irish wife, and the man is off the work. Um, I guess, a little bit too specific for me, but it's not the wrong answer by any way, shape or form, I think it is the right answer, but let's, let's make it a little more simple and say this is a housewife. What is the actual message? It's a stereotype of what? Gender roles. Hmm? Gender roles. Gender, everyone doesn't want to say it. Women do the fucking washing up. That's the message of it. So at the top level of meaning, we have an ideological statement being made. Men don't do the washing up. Men are too important to do washing up. Washing, men who do washing up are bitches. Women do the washing up. Why? Why do women do the washing up? Is it because you're inherently better? Man goes to work. Man goes to work, woman does the shit in the house. Welcome to the patriarchy, my friends. Again, there's a patriarchal message encoded in this text. See, when we finish this lecture, you're going to be seeing them everywhere. And you're going to be very, very angry. If you are, then my job has been done. So, semiotic analysis. When we conduct a semiotic analysis, we are literally deconstructing a text. What I'm going to cover today is the very foundational aspects of semiotics as a theoretical position. So we'll look at Ferdinand de Sasseur's idea of semiotics, Roland Barthes' idea of semiotics, the link between semiotics, what we call myth, for like the story that's created in the text, and how that links to ideology. And then we'll have a bash of doing one at the end. And seminars tomorrow you will be doing more of this. And I'll introduce, certainly with my group of three, a few more terms about um, semiotic analysis which will be useful as well. But the glossary entries that you've done will also be, you know, when you have the glossary with you, it will contextualise some of these extra terms. Okay, what's that on the screen? Oh. Is it? <laughs> that thing on the screen, what's it called? Broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> The non green thing on the screen, what's it called? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to keep on going like this until you all say it. <laughs> and again? <laughs> and last time. <laughs> Beautiful. It's, isn't it like being in primary school? It's great, isn't it? <laughs> no, this is not primary, this is a preschool chip. <laughs> you thought you were paying nine grand for higher ed. Oh, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> Dog. Really? Are there any other words that could be used uh, to name this thing? Pet. Pet. Interesting. Oh. That's not the same. Animal. That's not the same. Anything else? Man's best friend. Who said that? Who's that? <laughs> man's best friend. If I say man's best friend, does an image of that kind of thing come to you when I say it? Okay, well, I guess that works. Any others? Canine. Lovely. Or a hound. Does that work? Man How about like a you know, good boy? Man. Man, I'm a little bit higher level, but yeah, I guess it works. What about table? Four legs. <laughs> <laughs> No? No big buying table? Okay. A cat. Four legs, furry. 
eats all my fucking food. <laughs> no? You don't have that? What about wolf? You think? Or maybe wolf is a more specific kind of thing, perhaps bigger, more ferocious, <coughs> snow, you know, we've got a context in which wolves would be, you know, terrible Premier League football team. <laughs> it was a very specialised joke. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we're happy with this. That's a dog. Now, if I took that image off the screen, and I said to all of you, dog, you know what I meant. Dog here has a shared conceptual understanding for all of us. Okay, when I say the word dog, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah? So as a community of language users, we have a shared concept at a high level of what a dog is. So when I'm talking about dogs, you're not thinking about elephants. I mean, they both have four legs and they're animals, but you're not thinking about You've got a picture in your head, which may not be the same picture as me, but at least we have a shared understanding of the kind of animal we're discussing. The word dog and that image there are both signs. And signs are shared meanings. When we have signs in a culture, it means that the meaning of those signs is shared amongst a community of language users. If we don't share those meanings, they're not signs, because signs are a fundamental unit of communication. They have to be shared. When we use a sign, we use it in the way that other people can understand what we are talking about. If we have, if, let's, and this isn't a jump of the imagination, but let's assume that I've lost my mind, okay? And I start calling our friend the dog here, the Toblerone-shaped monkey. And I go around saying, in Singleton Park, you know, when people are walking those things, and say, that's an amazing Toblerone-shaped monkey. And the bloke's like, the fuck are you talking? Get it? Somebody call the police. This guy is clearly psycho. As soon as we step outside that shared meaning of things, we are no longer part of a language community. Nobody understands us anymore. Therefore, the idea of having like a private internal language, which is yours and yours alone, actually doesn't ever work because it, all language has to be shared, it doesn't have any meaning otherwise. And signs are the means by which we communicate meaning within a society. So when I tell you dog, you know what I mean. Perfect. Okay. The first theorist to try and understand this interconnected web of meaning in society was Ferdinand Gieser, a linguist, a Swiss linguist, who produced most of his work around the turn of the last century, around the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And he coined semiotics as a um, theory and gave it a definition. A science that studies the life of signs within society. Note the idea of the word science here. Now science supposes that there is a method, a standardised method for doing things that others can do. This is the fundamental basis of scientific inquiry. De Saussure thought that there was a way that you could understand signs in a very regimented and consistent way, and therefore could establish scientific principles around the understanding of signs in society. So, when we talk about semiotics, we are talking about the life of signs within a society. Life here referring to what the signs do, an activity, what they are involved in in terms of communicating meaning. And De Saussure's work sounds at this point actually quite complicated, but actually is devastatingly straightforward. Very, very easy to understand. But before we look at De Saussure, I've given you some other, or well, we've generated some other words which could refer to this image. Do I have any French speakers in the room? I was thinking. Go on, Anne. Chien. Chien. Do I have any Welsh speakers in the room? 
Okay. Kibach. Not Kibach. <laughs> Do we have any German speakers in the room? On my own, yeah? Das Hund. Do we have any Chinese speakers in the room? What's that called? Oh. Do we have any Spanish speakers in the room? Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any Portuguese speakers? Do I need to keep going on this path? <laughs> <laughs> Do we all get the point that I'm making here? Signs vary between different languages. We can all say dog and we know what it means. But if we were to say key, well, you and I would know what key means. I, I suspect a few other people in this room would as well. We'd be locking a lot of people out of that community of about what that means because we have language groups in which we fall into. In this room, we are all fortunate, we're all part of the same English speaking community. But there are French speaking communities, there are Welsh speaking communities, there are different variations of Chinese, of course, and there are different ways of speaking about things. There are just think about how many languages there are, thousands, each with their own conventions for signs. Therefore, signs are not universal. They are context-specific. A sign will vary on the context in which it is not just used, but who, what group of people is, is speaking. We develop signs as part of language communities, and therefore signs will vary between language communities. This is a very important point, because that means that there is no universality to how signs are done. They are all contextual. Dog, chen, hund, han. I can't speak Russian. I just found that word in Google Translate, but I don't know how to say it, right? But as an example, now, in that image, there are two signs for the dog. There is the representation itself, that is a sign. And there is the word dog that we associate with that image. That is also a sign. So when you have visual imagery, you have the visual representation itself and the word associated with it. They are both signs. They both have meaning. They are not the same as one another. They are related to one another in this case, but they are not identical to one another. So we better define what a sign is. For disasseur, a sign has two elements, the signifier and the signified. Now, in this example, the signifier is the three letters D-O-G. Dog. Sign. In two parts. That is, if you like, the representational form of it. The signifier. The signified is our mental concept of a dog. So when I say dog, appear dog. Yeah? The mental concept that is associated with the sign. And that is a shared conceptual item. What's interesting here is when I say dog, I'm triggering that reaction, you're all thinking of a different thing. The kind of dog, the breed of dog, the colour of dog, the name of the dog perhaps, are all different between you. But you can all agree that you're thinking of a dog. Because you understand what the sign means. And you understand what the mental concept is. Hairy animal with four legs, you know, barks at me when I come in through the door in the evening, that kind of thing. This is not the only way this works. A sign would also be the visual representation, and then the mental concept. So when we see the visual representation, we also think, oh, you're a dog. So it works in two ways here. You have the, like the verbal aspect, D-O-G, and the visual aspect, the image. The reason why I'm making a differentiation between these two things is important. In media studies, when we analyze semiotically, we are looking at both imagery and language. Both are very, very important. Imagery, and we can think that you know, there are certain media forms which rely heavily on imagery. There are some media forms which rely heavily on the written word. 
and there are some which combine the two to effect. So you're doing advertising, for example, you're normally looking at both the visual and the written as well, about how that written language anchors the meaning of the visual signs, how they interact with one another, and how they both work in a persuasive context. That's basically what that kind of analysis is, right? So, do we, are we all comfortable with what a sign is? Made up of two things, signifier and the signified. Always these two things. There are signs, there is something, and it means something, basically. And this is how it works. But there's an important concept that we need to understand. Ten point bump on any essay submitted, if anyone can tell me the artist. No? Cool. Perhaps <coughs> not violated the university's rules for assessment, <coughs> which is always a bonus. This is René Magritte, a very famous French um, artist. Okay, Frenchy, well, not Fr French Canadian y, because um, <laughs> there is a difference. Translate. This is not a pipe. Very, very famous image Magritte constructed in the 1950s. This is not a pipe. What's that thing? What is it? A pipe. So why is Magritte telling us that this is not a pipe? There's nothing in there. Nothing in there. Ooh. What would normally be in there? Don't say crack. <laughs> Tobacco, yeah. It's a very specialist kind of pipe that I avoided for this exercise. Um, but frankly available in certain areas of Swansea. Um, yes, normally a pipe would include a substance like tobacco, which we would light, and we put the pipe to our mouth and we would puff away, and it gives you an enormous sense of well-being. And cancer. So, you know, I'm not advocating doing this. The actual pipe has a physical form. This is just a representation. When we're talking about signs, we're not talking about the actual thing itself. That stuff. Signs are concepts. Yeah. This is why you can have a sign of something that doesn't exist. Unicorn. You all know what I mean? There ain't no such thing as a unicorn, there never has been. Sad times, uh, but sadly true. Um, there is no such thing as a unicorn. But we all know what I'm talking about. You all have an image in your head, even though you've never seen one. Right. Signs don't have to be of the real. Signs don't work at the level of the real physical thing. That's not a pipe, but you know it's a pipe because we have a shared conceptual understanding of what a pipe is. What Magritte is drawing attention to here is that semiotics does not deal with the real thing. It deals with how we construct meanings using visual information. That visual information doesn't have to be real. And this tells us a lot about how the media does it. You can sit through a Marvel movie and understand what's going on, right? Well, depending on which one it is. Because some of them I know have got into the galaxy, I've not got a fucking clue what's going on. But the stuff that you see on the screen ain't real. It's been constructed in a way to give you a particular set of meanings. It doesn't have to be a real thing. If, let's say, you grew up like being told that that's not a pipe, then you would believe it's not a pipe, even if, like. You would. You would have a different yeah. sign for it, I guess. Yeah. But your sign still wouldn't, still wouldn't refer to the real thing. Yeah. It would just be something that you used in. A particular context to communicate the meaning with somebody. This, when you guys have children, this is a really interesting way that you can mess with them. Right? And do it, don't do it small, do it big. Convince your children that, you know, dogs are not called dogs. They're called total own shape monk. I've given you the terminology for this, right? And really mess with them. Because what harm could come of it? You know, your child becomes a serial killer. Well, at least they're on TV. You know? At least they're going to have a Netflix documentary. Think of the, think of the royalties. 
And then you can go on TV and say, yeah, I made a monster, because they didn't know what a dog was. Don't raise serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> this is something I'm not advocating that you do this. This is not a pipe. And also, that's not a dog. To prove the point that that's not a dog, I've severed its head. Now, I wouldn't do that to a dog, and I would have not like that scene to a dog, but using the wonders, and you can see, of my really, really classy use of not even Photoshop, because I'm not even technically accomplished enough at anything to do that, I severed the head of the poor dog. To show you a very important thing, the representation of the dog, the word dog, is not a dog. Signs exist in reference to other signs only. They do not exist as physical objects. The physical object that we are talking about isn't the sign. The sign isn't the physical object. The sign circulates and only has meaning in relation to other signs in what we call a sign system, or what we would commonly call a language system. Any questions so far? I'm not really confusing anyone. Anyway. Because this sort of stuff can get a bit like, whoa, whoa, we're a big mind men here. It's not mentally, I promise. And I've given you loads of references for this week as well, which actually do a really good job of explaining this. Just to reinforce a point. If I were to say, and you can see how accomplished an artist I am at this point, because I've differentiated my stick figures. One has brown eyes and one has blue eyes. See that shit? So, stick figure brown. Do you want an orange? Stick figure blue? No, I prefer bananas. They both know what they're talking about with regards to oranges. Yeah? Both of them know what an orange is. And so this conversation is meaningful. If Mr. Brown over here was like, do you want an orange and he had an image of a banana because he thought you know, the sign orange referred to a banana, and the one banana, it could get messy. And they could end up fighting with one another. And that's not going to end well for either of them because they don't look built for fighting for me. Whoever drew this is obviously quite low down in terms of intellect. They get on fine. Despite the fact that they have different coloured eyes and therefore have so many differences in life, these people are getting on with one another just fine because they have a shared concept of what an orange is. They understand the sign orange, the word, and how it links to a mental concept which they both share. And this, my friends, is how we avoid genocide, war, pestilence, famine and death by being nice to each other and sharing meaning. It's when we stop doing that, and what was wrong with that? Semiotics is the foundation of world peace, as far as I'm concerned. Let's do a little thought exercise then. I want to describe what's called a conventional meaning of the following images that I'm going to show you. So, without doing any thinking whatsoever, what's that mean? Don't tell me what's in it, tell me what it means. London. Who said London? Why? What you see in London? London! Has anyone not been to London? No, you. You've missed nothing, don't worry about it. <laughs> what a terrible um, But, yeah, if I see that, the first thing that comes to mind is London, because, like, there's the red bus and the red fucking phone box. London. And London as a, you know, city uses these icons to advertise itself. It puts these icons out. It associates the meaning of the sign London with these visual representations. You go to any one of these horrendous gift shops in London or in an airport around London, and you'll see tat with this, based around this crap everywhere, right? Interesting points to me of this, I haven't seen one of those phone boxes since I was like eight. But you see a red phone box like that, and it's still London. There are people in this room, I guarantee you, who've actually never seen these kids before. They tend to pop up these days in people's gardens, where are the, I don't know, there's a garden, that Mumples, um, sorry, Dunn Gower, 
and you go down towards the silly, somebody's got that garden down there. Which kind of thinks to me, somebody's napped that. And I should be out there robbing stuff too, because obviously it was profit. Um, but yeah, this is London, right? Now, to go back to my previous slides, da, 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 that's not London. London doesn't look like that. London is a dump. <laughs> London is depressing as shit. <laughs> London is dirty. Oh, it stinks. And it just simply does not look like this. Hey, there are bits of London which are really nice, to be fair. And there are bits of London which aren't so nice, like any other city. But I don't, I've, not, I've been to London so, you know, countless times, and I've never seen that. But I can still associate this image with London. Right? It's a conventional meaning. Okay, let's keep going. Conventional meaning only. Australia. Australia. Do we have anyone who has been to Australia? Only a couple of people. Do they look like that? <laughs> I've been to Australia, it did not look like that. I saw kangaroos and I also saw the sun, unsurprisingly, in Australia, but I did not see anything like that. It's very difficult to see that image when you spend a month sat inside a pub, which is basically what I did in Australia. Um, now, why do we think Australia? What is what anchors the meaning of Australia here? Kangaroos. Kangaroos are a symbolic sign which tells us you see a kangaroo, you think Australia. Can you find kangaroos elsewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah actually you can. Yeah. There's a few countries where they're indigenous to. And obviously you might go to a zoo or something, you might want to see a kangaroo. But you see a kangaroo and you think Aussies. And then you have a whole other associations with Australians. Do we have any other meanings that come to mind with Australia? Can we insult? There's no Australians in here. Fuck them. They're not taking this course. Let's go, let's go hot wild on those shackle dragons. Do we have any other meanings that we could call Australia? <laughs> one person. <laughs> You're the only one who thought that was funny. <laughs> Which brings you and I a bad <laughs> Okay, I won't, I won't dig too deep into how our antipodean friends have recently yeah. fell. Um, next slide. A bit more tricky, this one. Very nice. Island. Where's island? Where? Go to the end of Wales and it's about 30 miles over the water. <laughs> which is actually a really accurate geographical description of where it is. Um, are I, uh, do we have any Irish friends in the room? Or somebody who claims Irish heritage? I would, with your name, I would really expect that kind of, yeah. Especially with the spelling of it. Fantastic. So I'm not going to be very nasty about the Irish. Um, I also lived in Ireland for several years as well, so. Um, why? Why is, why is this island? Allah. 